Who is the tenth man? The tenth man is the man in your community who needs or will need psychiatric guidance. Yes, one out of ten of us will suffer at some time in our lives from an emotional disorder. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Ralph Bellamy. Our story is called Out of Sight, Out of Mind. But perhaps we ought to warn you that it doesn't concern the fickle lover who runs away. Nor is it about the henpecked businessman enjoying himself at Convention City. Rather, it concerns you. You and me. Us. If we've closed our eyes and hearts to our country's number one health problem, mental illness, this story concerns us. Our scene is Main Street. But it could be your street. Our characters are Sarah and Michael Stevens. But they could be your neighbors. Michael! Michael, where are you? Michael, answer me. Out here, Sarah, on the porch. Oh, for heaven's sake, what are you doing out here? I told you supper was on the table. I don't want anything to eat, Sarah. Someone's been tampering with the food. Michael, don't talk that way. I fixed supper myself. Farnham slipped in when you weren't looking and poisoned the food. Oh, Michael, now don't be so silly. Why would Mr. Farnham want to poison you? Because he hates me. He wants to get this house away from me. Oh, be reasonable, dear. You've been saying that for weeks now. How long can you keep this up? Forever, if I have to. Well, what's happened to you, Michael? You're so different. And this ridiculous idea about Mr. Farnham. Ridiculous idea? So he's turned you against me, too. Oh, Michael. He's after me all the time. Poisoning my food, appearing in my dreams, sending radio messages to my brain. I can hear him now. Sarah, don't let him. He's trying to drive me crazy. I can't stand it. I won't let him drive you crazy, Michael. I'll help you. Dr. Ballard, is there any hope for him? Of course there is. If there weren't any hope for him, there wouldn't be any need for psychiatrists like me, would there? I guess you're right. Now, tell me, who is this man, Farnham? He holds the mortgage on our house. I don't know why Michael thinks Mr. Farnham is trying to poison him, though. It's so foolish. But your husband sees it as a real threat. Mm. Well, we'll do what we can. You ought to be hospitalized at once. I think you should have him admitted to Cedar Manor. Oh, I'm afraid that's too expensive. We could never afford that. Time is very important in an illness of this kind. I'd like to start insulin shock therapy immediately. Well, what about the general hospital? Unfortunately, they have no facilities for psychotic patients. Well, then where can Michael go? Well, there's the state hospital. <gasps> state hospital? Well, that's such an awful place. Well, I'm sure they'll do everything they can. Well, remember those newspaper articles about... The bad conditions there? You know, the ones by that reporter, Johnny Durant? They were appalling. Oh, I never thought when I read those articles and saw those pictures that one day my husband would have to go there. Oh, why should such things be? It must be somebody's fault that the mentally ill aren't properly cared for in this state. Who is to blame? A lot of people. A lot of people who think that out of sight, out of mind is the best policy in handling the mentally ill. When I was younger, I was a great one for crusades. It didn't matter whether I was marching for political reform or for homeless dogs. I was always in there carrying a placard. Well, it seems as if there were a few lost causes I overlooked. Doing something for the mentally ill isn't a lost cause. Yet. And now you have a personal stake in it. Well, I, I think I'd better... Concentrate on getting Michael well again before I start tilting at windmills. Well, will you get in touch with the state hospital about admitting Michael? Of course. 
I wish I could be sure that I'm doing the right thing. Hello, Michael. Hello, Sarah. Well, you're looking well. well. Why shouldn't I? I'm perfectly all right. Sarah, do I have to stay here much longer? This is getting ridiculous. But, uh, Michael, the doctor said you ought to stay here a little while longer for treatment. They know I'm not sick. I never see a doctor from one end of the day to the other. Well, aren't they giving you any kind of treatment? Of course not. Why should they? There's nothing wrong with me. This whole business is part of Farnham's plot. Sometimes I think you're in on it too, Sarah. Oh, no, Michael, no, no. Realizing that there's been no change in Michael's condition, even after four weeks at the state hospital, Sarah decides to find out why he isn't getting any treatment. She questions the doctors, nurses, and attendants. They tell her that they are doing the best they can, but she's not convinced, and insists upon seeing the superintendent, Dr. Crockett. Come in. Come in and sit down, Mrs. Stevens. I was told you wanted to see me. Yes. I wanted to see you about my husband, Michael Stevens. Hmm. Dr. Crockett, why has nothing been done for him? Mrs. Stevens, this hospital is terribly overcrowded and terribly understaffed. He says he never sees a doctor at all. And his shirt was dirty and all wrinkled. Please, Mrs. Stevens, you must have a little more confidence in us. There's no telling what might have happened if you had kept him at home. Well, he'd be more comfortable there for one thing. Mrs. Stevens, I... Excuse me. Yes? No, I'm busy now. Ask him to wait, please. Now, Mrs. Stevens... Dr. Crockett, as a tax-paying citizen of this community, I demand that my husband get better treatment at this hospital. My dear and lady... And if nothing is done inside of two weeks, I shall take my husband's case to that newspaper reporter, Johnny Durant, and he'll write another expose about this hospital. Your husband's case is not a very spectacular example of neglect, Mrs. Stevens... But if you'd care to see Johnny Durant, I'd be glad to arrange it for you. What? Yes. It's curious you're mentioning Durant, because that call was from my secretary to say that he's waiting outside now. I'll ask him to come in, and you can talk to him. Miss Castle, would you ask Mr. Durant to come in now? Thank you. I, I don't understand this. I, I shouldn't think there'd be much love lost between you and Durant. After those articles he wrote about your hospital. It's your hospital, too, Mrs. Stevens, since you're a tax-paying citizen. And as a matter of fact, Mr. Durant paid me quite a few compliments, if you remember the articles very well. I don't remember anything like that. Yes, you probably paid more attention to the more sensational parts of the articles. We were afraid that might happen. We? Then you were in on it? My secret is out. Yes, it was collaboration. Oh, here's Mr. Durant. Hello, Dr. Crockett. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, come in, Johnny. Uh, this is Mrs. Stevens, one of your most avid readers. Well, how do you do, Mrs. Stevens? So you're interested in the hospital articles, hmm? Well, very much so, Mr. Durant. Sit down, Johnny. I think Mrs. Stevens is a little surprised to see, to see that we're not mortal enemies. Why? I don't get it. Because of your exposés. Oh. Well, Mrs. Stevens, Dr. Crockett gave me all that material. He did? You see, Mrs. Stevens... Uh, I want the people of this community to know what's wrong with their hospitals. Then maybe they can help us get improvements started. I've been talking like that for years, but nobody paid any attention to me. Johnny here showed me how to get the facts before the public. And we've just begun. I see. Well, it looks as if we're all on the same side then. Hmm. Well, Dr. Crockett, I, I feel a little foolish about my outburst. Oh, that's all right. I understand how you feel. I must admit, however, that I've never become completely callous about being denounced. It hurts every time. Oh, then I'm doubly sorry. But just the same... You're still trying to find out who's to blame for bad conditions here? Yes. My woman's curiosity, I guess. 
But there must be some reason why nothing's been done to improve things. There's a good reason, all right. Haven't you heard about Barnes and his budget committee up at the state capitol? Senator Barnes? Why, I, I voted for him. Oh, but I'd always understood that he was honest. Oh, he's honest, all right, but he'd like to be our next governor. So he's gathering votes while he may, and he's doing it by telling people that he's saving their money. But I still don't see Look, that... Mrs. Stevens, sometimes you have to spend money to save it. One of the ways he's trying to save your money is by killing the proposed appropriations to provide more psychiatric facilities. Some of that money could be used to make this place a real hospital where our patients will get treatment instead of an asylum where you simply feed and house the insane. If Dr. Crockett had the necessary personnel and equipment, he could send many of his patients home. And in the long run, that would save the state much more money than budget slashing would. So Barnes is to blame. But what can we do about it? Don't be too hard on Kenneth Barnes, Mrs. Stevens. He's very well thought of. After all, you voted for him. Yes, I did. Then... Well, that, that makes it my fault. Mine and the rest of us who voted for him. Mm. But, oh, I didn't realize what it would eventually mean to me. It's too bad that it had to be brought home to you at this particular moment. I suppose I'd have gone on wondering who was to blame, thinking of everybody under the sun but myself. Let's not uh, waste time talking about who's to blame, since we're all at fault, one way or another. But now that you know, Mrs. Stevens... What are you going to do about it? What am I going to do about it? Why, I don't know. What can I? I mean, well, something ought to be done. Somebody ought to be told. Now you're talking. My husband's health is at stake. A lot of other people's, too. Well, I'm going to all my friends and make them understand what's happening. I'll shout it from the housetops if necessary. Oh, yes, Kenneth Barnes will hear from me. Sarah wasn't bluffing when she said she was going to battle for the mentally ill. The world needs more people like Sarah Stevens. Your community needs people who, once they realize the needs of the mentally ill, will want to help them. Are you doing all you can? Or are you content to let them remain out of sight, out of mind? You have been listening to Out of Sight, Out of Mind, produced by the National Mental Health Foundation, and presented through the cooperation of other organizations dedicated to the preservation of mental health. Ralph Bellamy was heard as narrator.